Friends, God is good. And all the time. If you're not surprised, you can see I'm just reading behind you, of course, following your programs as well. First of all, your guests today, we love for you to pull out our guest cards. Otherwise, prayer requests on the other side of our guest cards, just drop those cards off in the offering plate, which is right by where the LA Game program is this morning. The other announcements are covered as well. We have pens and both entrances. It's a great way to invite someone to Christmas Eve service if you're so inclined. It has some minor details on the pens as well, but take them with you. For many of you, this is not your first time with these, but go ahead and pass them on. It's a great way to potentially invite someone. So, pens are at the door. Go ahead and grab some of those. Meanwhile, today, from 2.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. will be the Keller Christmas Open House. Who needs to prepare the house is clean? Wow. <laughs> About as best as we're going to get with every, the chaos of Athena's mom at this point. But um, still, the house is ready 2.30 to 6 p.m. It's an open house, which means everyone is welcome. Even if you have your own personal cousin Eddie from National Anthem's Christmas, you know what I'm talking about if you've seen the movie. Um, but come on out. That's today, 2.30 to 6 p.m. We'll be open at the Parsonage. The invitations are at the doors. So make sure you grab one just in case you need any more details. They are both entrance ways on this paper. Right Tuesday night at beginning of 5 30 p.m. will be Christmas caroling sent out from the church here. Details are on the screen, details are in your programs. But that's this Tuesday night, 5 30 p.m. Meanwhile, next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. will be our Christmas cantata here at the church. And so next Sunday night, Christmas cantata here at the church at 7 p.m. As our group has been working tirelessly to prepare for next Sunday night. Our scarves and hats are downstairs. Still could use some scarves, hats, gloves, whatever you like to put on it for needy kids in the area. Thanks to the missions team and Sue Burner for working on that. And for a moment for recognition this morning, if you didn't hear, last Sunday night we almost shut down Mercer. Do you know why? It was not Occupy Mercer, not at all. But instead, it was because of the kids' Christmas program. There were 140 people here in the pews. I did the count. That is not inflated pastor numbers. <laughs> Somebody's going to check up on me. I'm not counting the kids we had. I'm not counting the stage hands. 140 people, friends. So for those who are part of me, you need to say thank you to Lincoln and Landon and Emily and Morgan and Xander and Zach and Connor, and Jenna, and Brayden, and Keegan, and Cameron, and Dylan, and Riley, and Adeline. And also to say thank you to Amy, the hit bales of hay tossing stagehand. <laughs> Sandra, who um, mostly got the curtains properly done, but we won't name the one time she may have messed up a little bit, but we'll let it go, since I got in the way as well. Let alone Jamie Segula, let alone Kale running the sound, kneeling the whole time so they could hit the buttons right on the CD player because our sound booth is so goofy, the CD player is almost on the floor. As well as for Andy, who helped with the sound booth and helped set it up. Merle, who flew in from Disney, got in at 3 a.m. and was here and to get ready for that, or was it 3 p.m. and was here for that, whatever it was. Merle's wacky, and yet he still showed up. But especially to Pat, who through hours that none of us will understand or know, put an incredible time for this. So Pat, we just want to say thank you for all that you do. But it's not just the music. team in the choir, and then when we lost the pianist, she stepped in. The problem with how well Patty plays is we don't have much motivation to look for someone else. <laughs> and the problem with that mindset is that, <laughs> the problem with that is that sooner or later, the hours put in wear on you. So friends, just keep on praying for whoever that person is that God would have for us to have here to be our lead musician. And or lead musicians, we may have more than one person, however that works. We're asking to pray for it because it's actually unfair to just assume Patty will keep on playing and be able to. She does an incredible job. She would say she doesn't. Well, I disagree. But there, the time.
time-wise, there's only so much each of us can handle. And by the way, in a subtle way, if you think, oh, Patty, you just keep playing, I would suggest instead, you start taking the lessons and see how this works. <laughs> With that in mind, before you grab stones the rock and throw stones at me, friends, let's greet another one another with the love of Christ. Good job! You want so much food there, That's good. <laughs>
found peace giving power during World War I. Legend has it that on Christmas Eve, 1871, in the midst of fierce fighting between the armies of Germany and France during the Franco Prussian War, a French soldier suddenly jumped out of his muddy trench. Both sides stared at the seemingly crazy man, boldly standing with no weapon in his hand or at his side. He lifted his eyes to the heaven and sang in French the beginning of Condito de Noel, Joy to the World. The words fit as it states in one of the stanzas. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord God, loving Father, you fill us with joy through your Son, Jesus Christ. You enable us to live in peace with each other. Empower us to continue to joyfully live at peace with each other. Amen. <coughs> Starting April. Thank you. It's time for our children's message. For our youngest folks who like to come forward, that'd be a great thing. Morning, Mark. Morning, Lincoln. Morning, Dad. Morning, Salas. Good morning, Good morning, Lincoln. What did I say, Lincoln? Good morning, Lincoln. Oh, here he comes. Come on up, Grayson. Keep an eye on your breath. No. <laughs> Grayson, you suddenly got much taller. <coughs> You guys have anybody at school you don't like? <laughs> you don't have to tell me their names. Don't look at them if they're here. <laughs> but if there's not somebody at school that you don't like, here's the tough part. If you're going to follow Jesus, one of the hardest things Jesus asks us to do is actually love our enemies. But enemies is weird because for some people that the bully at school, at times there might be a teacher that you just don't like or it feels like they've got a lot for you. Sometimes it might not be as much a school, but a church where you think the pastor's just, oh wait, nobody thinks that way at all, do they? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But sooner or later, we can find someone that's our enemy. And yet Jesus, oh, Jesus, he messes with what I'd rather do and just be cranky with folks. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 143, verse 12, <laughs> It puts it this way, which is maybe how you would do it. Ready? In your unfailing love, silence my enemies, destroy all my foes. Isn't that good? Destroy them. And yet Jesus changes that around quite a bit. Because when you put in really God's hands, what we're supposed to do, which means like God took care of your enemies, and instead, what does God have for us? And Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 puts it this way. You've heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. <coughs> Ouch. So you may have somebody in, in school who is a real sour patch. Oh, wait, that's what I've got here this morning. So if you like sour patch kids, there you go. But if you see them, you may get that same feeling that sour patch kids give you. You know, your mouth gets really sour. You see them, you go, ugh, I don't want to see them at all. Jesus would tell us that instead of hating somebody else, Show them care. If there's a bully at school, avoid them, but don't be rude to them. Like, them in the halls or whatever. If you see somebody at school being picked on instead of jumping on the bandwagon as well, you need to be careful. He doesn't have to do easy things. But the one who was born in the stable died on the cross for you and for me, so he's not asking us to do anything easy. It's easy. <coughs> How about you? But some days I still feel like I have some folks who are. Look to me, they make me feel like I just ate a sour patch kid. But Jesus would tell us, show them up. Oh, scared for Jesus, but it goes through my head. <coughs> That's what did for me. Let's pray. So, Father, help us to love those who are around us. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, guys, sour patch kids right here. If you did not get an advent calendar, I have them right here. That's a countdown to Christmas. They're right there in this basket. If you like one, please grab it. And finally, if you just didn't get enough of uh, the weird stuff from last week with the eyeball <coughs> and blow pops, I've got them right here. Whatever you guys like. Sour Patch Pit kids, go and grab a bag. If you want some of these, please move them along. I really can't have too
too many eyeballs. Who's bald gum? In case you weren't here last week, it's bald gum. Don't be too worried. <coughs> Great job, Lincoln. You need two? Good. Take them both. Thanks, Connor. Got it, bud? Great job, Lincoln. Grayson, good job. Friends, let's continue to worship as we sing together. If you choose to and are able, let's stand together as we sing. <laughs> Friends, is there anything else we have to be praying for? We want to thank God for? Linda. Hi. 
Um, Roman's doing very well. She only has two more chemo's left. She has surgery scheduled in January 17th. But after going through all this, she just got her associate's degree from uh, somewhere. <laughs> So a woman battling cancer, going through chemo, is able to get her associate's degree. Wow, God is good. <coughs> Laverne. I have a nephew in pain, and uh, he was fixing dinner. His wife wanted to go lay down for a little bit. She was in his early 60s, and when he called her for dinner, she was dead. Oh. She, uh, I had no clue as to what happened, but it was very traumatic. So your nephew from Cain, his wife passed away. All right, early 60s. All right. Lamar, thank you. Friends, is there anything else we need to be praying for? Lisa. Thank you for your continued prayers for my niece, Courtney. Um, it looks like the battle against cancer might be taking a turn in the right direction, but we won't have the last of three to be here. Okay. And thanks be to God. And also be praying for Courtney and her own yes. spirit. That's the way yes. you put it. All right. So thanks be to God. Looks like the cancer isn't having the final say yet. Yes. Or, yeah. <coughs> you never know. Thanks, Lisa. Friends, is there anything else you want to thank God for? Praise God for who God is. Marla. The situation in France is so concerning for all of us. Yeah. 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 For the rioting and whatnot. That's happening in France. Grace and I agree. <laughs> yeah. And with our kids in church, wherever we are, Jesus would say, Let the little ones come unto me. I'm betting they did that same sort of thing. So, Terry, don't. Yeah. You guys stick it out. This probably means I shouldn't drag it out too long. Friends, anything else we got to be praying for? You want to thank God for it. Praise God for who God is. Ask you to come praying for Tina's mom, Carol. Made it through Thanksgiving. The day with family wore her out. And honestly, she laid in bed in the middle of the room the whole time. Um, as three of the, all five of the grandkids, let me say that, were in the house. And you know how grandkids are. So they were both, although... Brayden, the one that she watched the most, mostly watched football in the room with Carol the whole time. That was probably the time that neither one of them will ever rest at this point, how meaningful that was. But keep praying for Carol in this battle with cancer, which seems like the cancer is winning and will win, but it doesn't have the final say. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. <laughs> Show us, though. You 
are worthy of how we sing our praise. Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. We may gush on about politicians or about sports stars or about entertainers or about movie stars or singers or we may gush on about our neighbors or our family or our grandkids. But ultimately, Jesus, you are the one who's deserving of that praise. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. And yet we're still waiting for an end to the wars. We're still waiting for an, an end to how sin can attack us and there's the illnesses and, and death. We're waiting for that day. And as we watch the news, we see in France the chaos being brought about. We pray for peace. Father, we come before you. And we're asking, Father, for you to move and work in the lives of those that we mentioned this morning. We pray for Laverne's nephew's family as he lost his wife. We're praying for healing, Father, for them. In Jesus' name. Father, we're looking for you, Courtney. We pray for healing, healing for her. We pray for a change of heart as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And we've seen your hand at work, Father, so we give you thanks. We've seen your hand at work, whether it was Robin in his battle with cancer, seemingly winning the fight well on perseverance through chemo for associate's degree. We give you thanks. We're praising you, Father, for the healing you brought about upon Jonathan. Thanks be to God for the healing in John and Glenda's grandson. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Father, praise you for the safety of Katie has undergone the midst of her tour of duty. We thank you that John and Denise's daughter safe. And we praise you, Father, for Asher James, their grandson. We give you thanks. Father, we have seen your hand at work in our lives this week in so many good ways. But whether it's the ways that we like, the ways that we don't, we thank you that you work in our midst. Emmanuel, God with us, God amongst us. We give you thanks for how you care for us. And so we praise you. And we thank you as we praise Jesus, God to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, our uh, sermon text this morning comes from two different spots Psalm 72, as well as John chapter 13. Hey, good morning, Hope. Francis Hope makes way up here. Why don't we pray together? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Sitting in a nice sterile environment where you're sitting in a house by yourself. 
where the kids are behaving, or a spouse is actually doing what you thought they should be doing. It's very easy to say, oh, I love someone else. And then you get out there at the stores and somebody elbows you to get the last item on the rack, or wrapping paper hits you in the back of the head. Or somebody's shopping cart slams into your car door. Or the kids are screaming and yelling or constantly mentioning what they want for Christmas, or maybe that's your spouse, whatever it is. It is so easy to say we should love one another. It is so hard to put into practice to love one another. And yet that's what Jesus calls us to do. To love one another. But not just those we're closest to. He also calls us to love those we don't want to love. The folks we may call our enemies. Love one another. The people who seem to be more of the background to our lives. The folks that we may think that are on a stage, they might be nothing more than props or scenery. Jesus would say, love one another. Friends, it's very easy to talk about loving someone else. But to put this into practice, well, we need to model Jesus. Who entered the world that we live in, stepping down for this, this incredible ultimate throne of grace and power to be born in the manger to show us, take that step down and love those. So we may just think they're our scenery, we may think they're our enemies, we may think that, my goodness, they're driving me crazy right now. And they help us to love one another. If you and I are intentional about striving to love one another, then it will become more and more of an O holy thing. We're called to love one another. And, and, and part of the difficulty with loving one another is not the families and it's not the folks that we have on a Christmas card list. It's the people who are working with the life, but the folks that almost seem to be part of the scenery. It's very easy to treat people as useful for a period of time and then push them aside. For example, the letter goes like this. Dear John, I have been unable to sleep since I broke off our engagement. Won't you forgive and forget? Your absence is breaking my heart. I was a fool. Nobody can take your place. I love you. All my love, Belinda. <laughs> exactly, Grace. <laughs> P.S. Congratulations on winning last week's Powerball. <laughs> We're called to love one another, but not when it's convenient or advantageous for us. Jesus taught us to truly love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppressions shall cease. But especially to focus on that whole point to love one another, especially those who are in the background of our lives, the people that we don't even notice, when we go to the store, the stock boys, the cashiers, the people working at the deli, the folks who are there wrapping gifts that you just walk right by, or the person who tried to spritz you at the perfume if you're in the department store. The people who don't seem to really matter, because they're not on our Christmas cards list, we're not going to get a gift from them this year, nothing from them is going to be in our stocking. They're of no use. The paper boy who throws the paper, and all too often it's got the rips on it, and how do I know that? I used to be the paper boy who drew the paper and got the rips in the paper. The folks who seem to just be there, not be a part of our life. And Psalm 72, why I hope read right from Psalm 72 this morning was to remind us of those folks who, are who are peripheral. For he, the king, will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. The reminder from Psalm 72 is that the good king, who ultimately is found in Jesus, they will care for those who are the outcasts. They're, that king will care for the people everyone else ignores. The folks said, don't matter. Jesus is calling for us to love one another, for the people who are part of the scenery the unloved, the outcasts, the sinners, the lepers, the poor. But how can we who are called as Christians 
do this. Now, I'm saying that if you're not a Christian, then you're off the hook here. This is not for you. This is for those of us who call ourselves Christians. We say we follow Jesus. That means we're supposed to put into practice what Jesus would have us do. To defend and care for others, friends. But for those of us who are Christians, there is no escape clause here. There is no option because you don't like someone that you have to work with or at a job you have to work for. We're called to love one another. Love costs. Love costs. And yet when you're willing to love a person who can't pay you back, it's incredible what God will do through you. There is a front page article in the San Francisco Chronicle about a metro transit operator named Linda Wilson Allen. Linda loved the people who rode on her bus. She learned their names. Now, for most of us, we don't ride on the buses. I grew up around Pittsburgh. Bus drivers were not always the nicest people. Just saying. They weren't. Some of them were mighty cranky. First time I rode on the bus, the one bus driver was angry. I didn't understand how to put in the dollar and 25 cents on the bus. It was my fault that I didn't know. First time on, nope, about the last time I rode the bus too, but it's a side note. Meanwhile, Linda in San Francisco, that's not what she was known for. The article in paper went on to describe that she loved the people who rode on the bus. She learned their names. She waited for them if they were running late. She would make up the time later on in other routes so she didn't get behind. One lady who rode her bus was named Ivy. And Ivy had some heavy grocery bags. One day, Linda stops all the bags. She got off the bus and helped carry them onto the bus. Who does that? Someone who loves the people who ride their bus, I guess. Now Ivy will let other buses go by as she waits for Linda. And where I grew up around Pittsburgh, that would mean you're waiting anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour for the next bus. Linda saw a woman named Tanya in the bus shelter, and she could tell that Tanya was new to the area. It was around Thanksgiving. And so Linda said to Tanya, you're all out here by yourself. You don't know anybody. Come on over for Thanksgiving at my house. Who does that? I guess Linda, the bus driver. Tanya went over to her house. Now Tanya not only has a friend, she now has a second home. Folks who ride on Linda's bus, I guess, bring her in plants, bring her in gifts, bring her in scarves and hats. She's got this little collection thing for lost items on her bus as well, that if folks are needing something and haven't told find it, it moves along. If you've never ridden a bus <coughs> in the city, it can be a thankless job. You deal with cranky people, you deal with folks who take out all their anger on you, they're running late, and it's your fault that they are running late. And then there's Linda who instead of being cursed and affected by the cranky attitudes of some of the folks on her bus, shows them love. I'm going to put it this way. There's a lot to talk about with the Lord, she said. But when she gets to the end of the line, she always tells people, I love you. <laughs> you can imagine. Think about it. Getting on a bus, and the bus driver tells you she get off, I love you. I think some of us would go, there's something wrong with that driver. <laughs> and yet, because of when that consistently does that and shows people on her bus that she cares, she's changed people's lives. The article goes on to describe, people wonder, where can I find the church? The author of this article put it this way, I can tell you where you can find the church. It's behind the wheel of a metro transit vehicle. Because for Linda's sake, she put into practice loving others. Folks that she didn't think she, that could pay her back, she was intentional about loving them. Friends, at this time of year, it's even more imperative for those of us who call ourselves Christians to be intentional about loving folks who are the others, the folks who are part of scenery, the folks who are part of life that we really don't pay much attention to. Do you say thank you to the cashier at the store, or do you just think it's your job to get it done? Do you let the person who's walking in the crosswalk cross on the street, or you gas it so you can make sure you get through that yellow light and it doesn't turn red. <laughs> Look at your neighbors who have trouble shoveling their snow, saying, maybe I can go over a shovel today, I have the time. Or do you say, stinks to be them, they ought to hire somebody. What do we do to the folks that we call the others? 
do you make sure that you grab that last roll of wrapping paper or the stationery you just need for your Christmas letter or that last box of cards that are so beautiful talking about love as you snatch it from someone else? Or do you let it go to someone else who may need it more? Even if they don't need it more, how do we treat those people who are around us, who are peripheral, who, whether we say it out loud or not, we may think they're not that worth it. as a Christian, do the best you can to love them, but to put that into practice and care for them. If somebody crossing the street, stop your car. You'll be a minute late. It'll be a lot worse if you have to deal with the police because you hit someone or you got into a car accident. But more importantly than what could have been, show them up. If you're in the store and somebody gets in your way, it's not the biggest deal. Do you hear about how much road rage there is out there in the world? Showing other people love me, it's okay. You go ahead and cut me off. Maybe they actually need to get somewhere quicker. More importantly, no, it's that important. To show the people who are the others, the folks who are part of the scenery of our lives, the folks who are seem to be just like the, the banners in the church here, which we don't notice unless we change them. Show them the incredible love that God has given you. For each of us, it's going to work out differently. But the cashier, the person crossing the street, the mailman, the FedEx guy who may not have a clue where your house is, but they just bought, brought him in for the seasonal work and puts the box in the wrong house three times in a row, and you don't think that it happens. P and I, the first TV we purchased that was a, a, a widescreen TV, it was on our neighbor's front porch. And thankfully, Ed, who was six foot five. 300 pounds, bald head, and I knew he had a gun, wasn't home when I made sure I grabbed a TV. <laughs> Folks are going to make mistakes. We can show them love, or we can fall into the trap. I say it this morning because all too often in this season of showing love, what do we normally do? We treat the other person as other other than what we need to deal with. And Jesus sees how we do that. More importantly, he didn't make any distinctions. Look out for that step, right? He didn't make any distinctions at all with how important, how meaningful, or how close you were to him when he died in Christ. We're called to love one another. More than just loving one another in terms of the people who are peripheral to our lives, Jesus would also call us to love one another, including the folks we may call our enemies. You know the verse. I read it from the children's message this morning. You've heard it that was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, said Jesus, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Verse 46, it goes on to say, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? My friends, we're the Lord. Thanks be to God. Actually, love people like we call our enemies. But I don't know about you, I don't have a lot of people I would call enemies. In Jesus' day, the Romans, for the people who were Jewish, were the enemies. They had taken over their city, they had thrown out the Jews, they had erected this monstrosity of a temple that was more of an homage to Herod, to worship Herod, but it would point towards Caesar than it was to actually point to God. For the folks who were Jewish, they had totally desecrated everything. For those who were Steeler fans, Two weeks in a row of losing, you have an idea of the terrible thing you've done. It doesn't even come to us. Yeah, I'm a Steelers fan, but it was sort of like whenever somebody steps on a terrible power, lights it on fire if you're a Steelers fan. And you're getting there. And yet this was their whole identity for the folks who were Jewish in Jesus' day. They had enemies. And Jesus said, love them. I don't know about you, I have many enemies. But there's one way to make someone who's an enemy, per se, into someone who's not an enemy. At the end of the Civil War, many Northerners were demanding that the South be punished for the devastation the war had caused the United States. Feeling he was too soft on the South, a group visited President Lincoln at the White House. One man became so intense that he pounded on Lincoln's desk and said, Mr. President, I believe in destroying my enemy. Lincoln reflected for a moment, and then he slowly stood 
And Abraham also <coughs> said, Do we not destroy our enemies when we make them our friends? That helped, that mindset helped the <coughs> hostilities during the Civil War. But then sooner or later, if you look at world history, or at least I should say Civil War history, some folks abuse the situation. <coughs> but at least Lincoln got the point. You destroy your enemies by making your friends. But in Jesus' day, enemies was as much about those who want to attack you or hurt you as it was also the people who weren't like you. If you have an enemy at work, someone who's trying to attack you, <coughs> you have an enemy in your family, someone who seems to constantly berate or attack you, Jesus would say, love one another. That doesn't mean you trust them. But you're called to love one another. They don't deserve it. You're called to love one another. They haven't earned it. Love one another. I deserve better. But Jesus would still say, love one another. And I'd say it out of there because he loves you. But if you have someone who's an enemy, be intentional about loving them. I didn't say trust, but love them. Care for them. Pray for them. Be intentional. If somebody's your enemy that you're called to pray for, maybe pray for them more than your sick family members. Because often when someone becomes your enemy, especially if it's not your own doing, there's something wrong within them. At least for me as a pastor, times I find when people are angry and frustrated at me, they're not really angry with me. They're angry at God, and I get to be the lightning rod. You may have that same situation as well. But on the other side of this, if someone's your enemy, per se, at least the scriptures here are pointing to the folks who are the, the folks who are the others, the folks who don't look like us. I mean, look around the room, we're mostly Caucasian, we're mostly white, correct? Just checking. All right. If somebody who's black came in here, what would we do? If somebody who was Hispanic, what would we do? If someone was an illegal alien, what would we do? What do you do with somebody who's a recovering prostitute or someone who's a recovering addict? What do we do with someone who's a recovering child abuser? That's what Jesus is saying, love your enemy. Didn't say trust, but love your enemy. The folks who are not like us, we're not free to treat as they're contagious. What I find fascinating is when I'm willing to get to know someone else, things change. I mentioned a few weeks ago about how on Saturday morning I went for a walk and I ran into a young man up by the courthouse. I don't know if I mentioned it or not, he had, nose, he had a nose ring, he had earrings. The young man was smoking a cigarette in front of me and my parents had both, my dad died from lung cancer and most likely caused by the smoking. My mom has had cancer, including the fact that they had to remove her bladder because of smoking. So for me, smoking, ugh. That's on a personal level. He, the young man and I, we still talk for an hour or so. He's an other for me until you get to know him. Who's that other person in your life? The not like me sort of thing which Jesus may be hinting at here with our enemies. Who is that person in your life? Is he still saying, love one another? Friends, if you're thinking I'm meddling a little too much here, you did know Jesus was Jewish, right? You did know that, right? No. I'm not a Jew, but most of us in this room probably are not Jewish by birth, correct? I have family members who are, but I'm not. So to Jesus, I'd be that other. Thanks be to God. He looked at me and he said, I love you. Thanks be to God that in, in spite of who I am or what I've done in the past, he said, I love you. So friends, we're called to show others the kind of love that Jesus loved, show. Somebody's your enemy, pray for them. If somebody gets on your nerves, show them caring. If they drive you up a wall, or they seem to want to run you over with a shopping cart as though you're in a crash <coughs> test derby, crash <coughs> test derby, what do you call that thing, crash? <coughs> Is that a crash test derby when the cars run into each other on purpose? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. Thanks, Connor. <laughs> That's, I don't know why I'm getting this. I think I'm thinking crash test dummies. 
Just whatever it may be. We'll move on. Instead of all those things going on, the intention of showing up people love. They don't deserve it. Neither do you. Here's your assignment for this week if you choose to accept it. There we go. Maybe I'm back on. I touched the, the wire for packets. We'll move on. For many of us, it doesn't really matter. Show someone's Christ love this week who you would normally ignore. Just show them Jesus' love. If it's a sales clerk, if it's your neighbor, your family member, honestly, this time of year, some of you, you need to show yourself some love. You may just need to take a personal day and get away, not answer your phone, ignore your kids. I mean, not literally, but you know what I mean. Yeah, for example, some of our kids, we totally ignore them. They wouldn't be around, but you may need to take that time. Show someone who's the other real love. If you already have a name that's jumping into your head, that's the person. Sorry. That's how it normally works. That's how God speaks to us. When you have that chance, tell that person why. Don't limp out. Because, friends, only night we would enter that third stanza, he truly taught, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. And Jesus called for us to love one another. This is not easy. No wonder he mentions it so many times in the Bible that it gets to be repetitive. Because it's not easy. But just because it's not easy doesn't mean we shouldn't try. To love each other deeply. To love others deeply. But he's not just saying love one another with those in our family or the people who we know in church. He's getting at so much more. The real point of him saying love one another is the folks who are the others in our life. Whether they're the sales people or whatever who seem to be the scenery, or the folks who slide into being our enemies. Whether it's because they're out to get us, or because they're not in all like us. Jesus calls us to love the outcasts, love the enemies. How? Well, love those who can't pay you back. And for those who are trying to pay you back, still show them love. Selflessly care for others. Friends, it's not easy. But it's worth it. If we're intentional about showing other people love, we're going to move closer and closer to a truly being <coughs> so holy night. Amen. Friends, would you pray with me? You can find the prayer on the street behind me. I encourage you, though, to close your eyes, turn your hands up toward heaven. Let's talk with God through pray. Lord God, loving Father, Lord God, loving Father, I love you. Your love for me overwhelms me. Empower me to love others. Enrich me to help the needy. Strengthen me to care for the afflicted. Empower me to help the weak. Remind me of how you love the others in my life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's continue to worship as we sing together. Let's stand if we so are able to.
Oh. 